Hello, welcome to the New Heights Show on Education. This is your host, uh, Pamela Clark, for the show Education in the News. Welcome back to another episode. And this morning we're going to get right into it. we got a lot of news stories happening, and I want to share as many with you as I can. <clears throat> the first one I have for you is from the Smart Brief on EdTech, and it was a a story that EdSurge covered. Colleges rethinking student engagement practices. Residential colleges are taking another look at their online learning practices as the engagement of students in online and hybrid courses fails. Uh, Some schools are looking to their online counterparts to see how they structure support services to create a sense of community and accountability for remote students. If you want to read the full article, you can go to EdSearch and run a search for the Colleges Rethinking Student Engagement Practices. Smart Brief on Education covered this story. Uh, It's District C's Benefit of Teaching or of Teacher Coaching with Video using classroom videos to aid in the teacher coaching process has proved successful in Gainesville Independent School District. Assistant Superintendent Lacresa Style writes, teachers in the Texas district start with reflection videos to boost their comfort level and get question and get question prompts to guide the process. The video helps coach the coaches too still adds. And here's a story from Education Week. It says that they, uh, there was a study done that says strategies to overhaul online credit recovery. School administrators should consider overhauling online credit recovery systems, according to a guidance report from Ed Research for Recovery Project. The study's author, Carolyn Heinrich, who also is a professor of public policy, education, and economics at Vanderbilt University, shares five ways to strengthen such programs, including monitoring students' progress. Education Week also uh, covered this story titled, Schools See Largest Enrollment Decline Since 1943. Public school enrollment from fall 2019 to fall 2020 fell 3% in the U.S. This is the largest single year decline since 1943 during World War II, according to data from the National Center for Education Statistics 2022 Condition of Education Report. The report revealed a decline in early childhood education enrollment and uptick in homeschooling. The next story I have from you is covered by Politico. It says schools may get USDA funding to buy U.S. commodities. President Joe Biden's administration may tap about $1 billion in USDA funds to help schools buy U.S. commodities for student mill programs. The move is seen as a way to help schools cope with the end of the coronavirus pandemic waivers that have funded free meals for all students. Excuse me. The next story I have for you is from the Topeka Capital Journal. And it, the title is Teachers TikTok Videos Share Lessons on Kansas History. An eighth grade social studies and video production teacher in Kansas has found a following on TikTok. After posting videos to engage students in state history and social studies, Craig Westoff's most popular recent topic was a breakdown about the origins of count, county names in the state. <clears throat> CNN shared this story titled Healthy Sleep Eludes Many Teenagers, author says. A new book by Lisa Lewis 
titled The Sleep Deprived Teen, Why Our Teenagers Are So Tired, and How Parents and Schools Can Help Them Thrive, examines what caregivers and parents need to know about helping teenagers maintain healthy sleep, including factors that prevent it, what can be done, and why teens need more rest than adults. Lewis has been helping to revamp California school start time laws to allow teenagers to get more sleep. Sorry, just give me a moment here. Okay, the next stories I have for you are from Ohio Ed Updates. Cleveland ABC T ABC 5, excuse me, said that a federal waiver providing free lunch year-round to students set to expire. A federal waiver is set to expire that provides millions of students access to free lunch year-round. For the last two years, the measure has expanded kids' access to food, but Congress has decided not to include an extension to the waiver that allowed nearly 10 million students access to the free meals. When the um, National School Lunch Program restarts in the fall, without the waiver, schools will be required to meet pre-pandemic nutritional requirements, which may no longer be feasible given ongoing supply chain problems. Quote, school districts do have some, do have summer programs available that make meals available to students free of cost, as well as during the school year says Brian Davis, Assistant Director for the USDA Foods Program at the Ohio Department of Education. Those mills will still be available, but the schools will be going back to traditional methods of determining eligibility. <clears throat> Mahoning Matters um, reported on this story. It's um, titled, Ohio Department of Education Awards More Than $5 Million for After-School Services in the Valley. Organizations in the Mahoning Valley were recently awarded more than $5 million from the Ohio Department of Education to create or expand after-school services. In total, the Ohio Department of Education awarded $89 million in summer learning and after-school opportunities grants to 161 community centers colleges, and universities. Faith-based organizations, art centers, neighborhood outreach centers, and youth activity centers, according to a news release on its website. The funds will be used for services that address the academic needs and overall well-being of students most in need of services as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. Springfield News Sun reported that Wittenberg awarded $400,000 in math literacy tutoring grant for local students. Wittenberg University Education Department was awarded more than $400,000 in a math and literacy tutoring grant for local K-12 students. The Ohio Department of Education, in partnership with the Ohio Department of Higher Education, awarded a total of $14 million in statewide math and literacy tutoring grants to colleges and universities to help create or expand those programs for K-12 students in one-on-one -on -one or small group settings, according to the Ohio Department of Education. These federal COVID-19 relief grants are to focus on providing services for Ohio students who experience greater disruptions to learning and didn't engage consistently in school during the pandemic. And Richland Source reports that local students among the Ohio Connections Academy class of 2022, that nearly 450 graduating seniors with, from more than 50 counties across the state recently received their high school diplomas as members of Ohio Connections Academy's OCA class of 2022. More than 200 of those students traveled to Columbus on June 4th to participate in an online public charter schools commencement ceremony. The class of 2022 is the school's 14th graduating class for the provider of high quality tuition-free virtual education 
for students in grades K to 12. More than a third of the 2022 graduates ind indicated they plan to attend a two to four year college university, including Miami of Ohio, Kent State University, University of Cincinnati, Mount Vernon Nazarene, Bowling Green State University, and the Ohio State University. Other graduates plan to attend vocational trade schools, enter the workforce, or join the military. Uh, here's another story from uh, Springfield News Sun. Springfield Schools takes its summer program on the road. Springfield Local Schools is taking its summer reading program on the road with this mobile summer spark program. The free program provides students grades K through 5 with access to books, outreach activities, and learning stations. Families can enroll online with assistance available from 8 to 4 p.m. at the district's administrative offices located at 6900 Hall Street in Holland. District Enrollment Coordinator Crystal Williams will be on site at Summer Spark locations on June 21st through the 22nd as well as June 27th to assist with enrollment services from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. And Cleveland.com reports that a high school principal search nets two new administrators for Chagrin Falls schools. Michael Janatovich has been named principal of Chagrin Falls High School and Jared Mohiman has been hired for the district's newly created position of Director of Student Advancement. The Chagrin Falls Board of Education approved contracts for both administrators at a special meeting Wednesday, June 8, uh, 2022, of course. And other action, the board approved contracts for four teachers for the 2022-2023 school year, all effective on August 15th. We're going to take a quick commercial break, and I'm going to be right back. Hello, listeners. If you're enjoying the New Heights show on education and want to support or donate to our organization, please visit www.newheightseducation.org. While you're there, check out our online store. Welcome back to the New Heights Show on Education. This is your host, Pamela Clark, and we're um, I'm sharing news stories, educational news stories across the, the country and the world. <laughs> okay, so let's get right back into it. Um, this next story I have for you is from the Coast Star in Madisquin, New Jersey. It's titled, Field Trip Encourages Local Government Participation. As part of the annual Youth Government Day, a middle school students from Spring Lake Heights School in New Jersey wrote civic proposals, applied for town council positions, and held their own council meetings. The outing helps students put in practice the civics lessons they learn at school, says teacher Kevin Preston, and shows them how to be informed, involved citizens in the community. The next story was covered by WFYI-TV and WFYI-FM in Indianapolis. Indianapolis approves sixth grade civic standards. The Indiana Board of Education on Tuesday adopted a middle school civic standards following the passage of a new law, or of a law, that requires sixth grade graders to learn civics. Why well, there are topics such as the Bill of Rights as well as documents like Magna Carta that guide what should be taught starting in 2023-2024 school year. Decisions about specifics from U.S. history such as slavery are left up to the schools. WBRC-TV TV in Birmingham, Alabama 
uh, shared that students are getting hands-on with Career Pass at camp. Alabama middle school students learned about careers in fields such as construction and welding during the Career Tech Summer Exploratory Camp, working on project, projects such as building a frame for a raised flower bed, give students a taste of what types of work involved in these careers, according to Administrator Marlon Murray. And the next stories I have for you are covered by the Insider, or Inside Higher Ed, I'm sorry, I apologize. I get kind of tongue-tied sometimes. Um, Inside Higher Ed and The Journal. And it's titled ISTE, Education Department, Launch Digital Equity Pledge. More than a dozen educator preparation programs already have signed on to a new pledge from the International Society of Technology and Education and the U.S. Department of Education called the EPPs for a Digital Equity and or Transformation Pledge. Those who sign on to commit to prepare teachers for digital learning environments and to use technology in professional learning. The, the Seattle Times reports that law allows students excused absences for mental health. Beginning next year, students in Washington State will be able to have excused absences for mental health reasons. Quote, many, or mental, I'm sorry, quote, this is the beginning of the quote, mental has as much significance as physical health and is similarly important to one's overall well-being. End of quote. Bridget Underdahl, supervisor for Project Aware, said. Okay, I have uh, another thing to share with you. Just a moment. This was, ob this was actually shared on TikTok, and it's a bit of like a homeschool news. Um, it's an audio recording, so I'm going to uh, play it for you. Just a moment when I get it ready. I'm still gathering information on this developing story, but a friend reached out to me this morning while I was in a concert with my kids. Apparently in Perry County, Kentucky, there have been unannounced home visits to homeschooling families. Let me tell you the details. They are arriving in unmarked police cars, coming unannounced and knocking on homeschoolers doors. Apparently what started happening first were repeated phone calls of officials repeatedly begging parents to re-enroll their kids and also asking why they were homeschooling. My understanding that when parents said, no, I'm not planning to re-enroll my kid, they then said, well, we're gonna start doing home visits. I did a little digging and apparently Kentucky has been in hot water before with unannounced home visits of homeschoolers once in 2015 and then again in 2017, both times apparently HSLDA had to get involved. HSLDA has done so much work to protect our Fourth Amendment rights of families to be safe from unwarranted government intervention. It is the official stance of HSLDA that unwarranted home visits are a violation of our constitutional rights. I am not a lawyer. I do not work for HSLDA. I do think, however, that now is the time that we do become members there if you're not already, especially if you're in a state where school districts do not understand their own state laws regarding homeschooling. It's more common than you think. To knock on people's door to guilt and bully parents or even ask them why they are homeschooling is such a violation of privacy. I'm like all worked up over it. Send this to everyone that you know who homeschools. I'll be checking my comment section regularly. If you do live in Kentucky, if you are one of these families that this happened to, please comment. I really hope that you have already been on the phone with HSLDA and have spoken with their lawyers. If you're a homeschooling parent who has had to deal with this, please let us know what happened and what you did. I'm still gathering information on this developing story, but a friend reached out to me this morning while I was in a concert with my kids. Apparently in Perry County, Kentucky, Oh, sorry, it's starting to repeat. 
Okay, so um, I had looked into this briefly, and I, I came across some people that this has actually happened to. Um, and I, I, I have been telling people, if you go back and listen to some of my previous shows, for some time since, well, really since even before this, the school year started um, last year, um, maybe even the year before, that I have highly suggested that people join Homeschool Legal Defense if they're homeschooling now. Because of all the things that we're seeing happening, and sooner or later, they are going to come to, for homeschoolers. And I know some people are like, well, what do you mean, who's they? Well, <laughs> the people that are trying to take our rights away from us, um, they don't want families to be homeschooling. So I, I really suggest that everyone join Homeschool Legal Defense. Now, I will say that New Heights Educational Group is um, a partner and an affiliate and we do have our own group code and everything if you'd like to join through us it's fine and um, we're always happy to share that information with you but that's not why i'm sharing that with you i'm sharing it because i truly believe that you need to have a relationship with homeschool legal defense and and join their member group because if you do get in trouble as a homeschooler you have to be with them already for them to take your case. <clears throat> so please take these things serious. And if somebody comes to your door um, and, and tries to force their way in, do not let them in your house. Just even if you have to, even if they come with a police officer, don't let them in your house. Get on the phone with Homeschool Legal Defense and um, let the attorneys handle that. Uh, it's not okay that this is happening. Now, um, from this, I've heard that um, someone from Kentucky said that this had happened to them as well. And they were already with Homeschool Legal Defense and they did step in and stopped it and didn't allow them to bully them. Um, I'm trying to see. I thought there were some others I saw. Okay, just a moment, I'm looking for more people. That's pretty much the consens consensus of experienced homeschoolers, and I was at one time a homeschool mom, and um, I believe quite successful at it. It was hard and challenging, and and so forth, but, um, you know, I, I had educated myself on a lot of things during my journey through homeschooling. So, yeah. I, there, there's another report here from um, a, a person from um, Mullenberg County, Kentucky, and says that they all got letters trying to get us to re-enroll homeschool legal to Defense Administration fought back on our behalf. Even the non-members were joining as soon as possible. Still looking through to see if there's other stories from this story for me to share. This one person, and it doesn't necessarily have a direct connection to what this person was sharing. This says, I homeschool my son and it was a hassle to get him out of public school. I sent my papers to the board and didn't send him back. Now, I have had people that have come to me locally um, and even in neighboring communities that the, the, the public school outright lied to them. Like, let's say they went halfway through or even made it to like November and they wanted to homeschool their child. The that the schools were telling them, no, you can't, you missed the deadline. And that's not true, that there's not a deadline. So you can start homeschooling anytime throughout the year. In Ohio, I'm speaking in Ohio now, um, each state we'd have to look at separately to see if that's the case. Um, here's someone else from Idaho that said that they had the police show up because there was an anonymous concern call about their kids not being in school. And um, 
and I did hear another news story um, for Virginia, but it wasn't necessary for homeschooling. And I'll come back to this. I'm, I'm trying to look through my notes here, but um, that the students of a specific school in uh, Virginia had just served um, legal documents against the school, I think due to the the mask mandates and so forth. So I did see that. Um, I think the, the school board was trying not, like they were trying to leave and not take the paperwork, but I'm not sure exactly what happened. I'm sure that they left all of it there. And there were, I think there was an attorney um, there that was um, advocating for them. Um, here's one from Michigan that's a homeschooler and it says, I've been receiving multiple texts from the public schools in my area, um, which again, they shouldn't be texting or calling or harassing in any way. Okay, so there may be some others here, but I'm not seeing them. So we'll move on to the next news story. I just kind of wanted to share that with you and and uh, share some of the other locations that it's been happening in as well. Okay, so um, the next stories I have for you are for Phil, uh, Philanthropic Thropy News Digest. Philanthropy News Digest. Um, Joyce Foundation names recipients of the 2022 Joyce Awards. The winning um, collaborations will engage communities in Chicago, Detroit, Indianapolis, Minneapolis, St. Paul, by exploring how the visual and performing arts can uplift local histories and traditional knowledge, deepen understanding the immigrant experiences, foster inclusivity, and encourage greater community cohesion. Uh, let's see. Women's Funding Network calls for support for reproductive justice. And its latest call out, Women's Funding Network laid out five actions that donors and philanthropy at large could take support of reproductive justice. Hold on a moment. The call comes in the wake of the leaked draft opinion in Dobbs versus Jackson, Women Health organization case, which suggests that Roe v. Wade, the landmark 1973 U.S. Supreme Court decision that legalized abortion, would be overturned this summer. In its latest call-out, Women's Funding Network laid out five actions that donors and philanthropy at large could take in support of reproductive justice, giving to local abortion funds and independent abortion providers and trusts that they have the experience to use the funds where they are most needed, listen, learn, and follow the lead of people on the front lines, particularly those who have had abortions, as well as BIPOC-led organizations that will disproportionately have affected, plan for the future while acknowledging the past, encourage collaboration among the funders, and philanthropy serving organizations, organizers, lawyers, and invest in existing movement infrastructure for the long term. You can read all about this uh, by going to philanthropynewsdigest.org and typing in Women's Funding Network Calls for Support of Reproductive Justice. Bringing up the next news story. Sorry, there's a lot of them. Okay, just a moment. My computer's being a little silly. Um, I'll find you the next one here in a moment. I apologize. <laughs> Just not All right. Here, 
Here is another one from Smart Brief on EdTech. This was covered by Smart Brief um, on Education. Superintendent, uh, how to support learning recovery. Schools can take several steps to support learning recovery, asserts Teresa Axford, Superintendent of Schools at the Monroe County School District in Florida. In this blog post, Axford shares several ways that the district is doing this, such as focusing on student growth and embracing technology. Now, as someone that works in the nonprofit world, in the education nonprofit world, I, I really don't think that any compulsory school, number one, they don't really care about um, learning, learning recovery. I mean, they may say they do, but if they did, most of them that are DNF filling schools would improve themselves. And um, they would also have figured out how to teach students that are hard to reach by now. And I know I may get a little slack from that, but I'm the one that has worked with these kids that have been skipped over, forgotten, and just were unreachable in the public schools. And I've been doing so for about 18 years now. And we can reach those. Our nonprofit has reached those kids. And, and sometimes these kids are s people that maybe even graduated high school that can't read or that dropped out of high school and can't read. Or maybe they can read, but they have other issues. So... And I know that in general, from being a homeschool mom, that what I have seen most of the time is that the public school kids are about two years behind a homeschool student or their curriculum. So when somebody comes to me and let's say they choose that they want to homeschool, usually we have to start them two years back just to figure out where the gaps occurred. Sometimes we have to go even further back than that. But they do progress fairly quickly through the curriculum and they do very well at it. But there are some schools that I have been told by board members of schools that, um, that their curriculum that they're graduating kids on or using to educate them is really at a ninth grade or below level, but they repackage it and make it like it's a high school curriculum. And that's, I really think it's to, you know, boost those test scores and so forth. And I trust the individual that told me that, um, he holds a very, um, important position even in a local community here, but I've heard of it happening other places as well. But it was the most drastic, um, and I was told this uh, years ago. So, and it kind of makes sense uh, for what we see locally. But if you really want to change a child's life, you have to go back in time before it's. It, it's never really completely too late. But if they're getting towards the end of their high school career and they're just flunking out of everything, you're almost too late in the sense if you want them to graduate at a specific age or within a specific time span of their life or their, you know, their young lives. So, and if you have to go at least two years back and then build them back up, that's normally what we have to do. And we use specific curriculum to do that that's very good and the curriculum that we use here at New Heights it's it's a mixture of different types of things um, I would say most of it is from the homeschool world and it's far superior to what the the um, the schools have and I really believe that or I wouldn't say it so um, yeah I, I wanted to share that with you because I I just I just don't buy that. 
All right. Uh, the 74 reported that Baltimore teacher keeps students together for learning. Kayar Butts, a teacher in Baltimore, says he was rem remained a constant for students during years of disruption caused by the coronavirus pandemic. Butts says he offers students straight talk, including research showing the effects of growing up poor and support uh, BIA team teaching in which one person teaches while other educators are available via Zoom to chat and answer questions. And WTOPFM reported, and they are in Washington, D.C., by the way, um, that Virginia STEM Club pairs high school girls, younger peers, the women interested in science and engineering, also known as WISE Club, pairs girls from Wyanoke Elementary School with older mentors from Thomas Jefferson High School for Science and Technology in Fairfax County, Virginia, to encourage the younger peers to pursue STEM studies, says high school chemistry teacher Robin Taylor. The group conducts experiments such as creating rockets, writing code, and making slushy drinks using Kool-Aid or juice. The Washington Post uh, covered a story as a survey that they had done titled Schools Report Uptick in Mental Health Needs. 70% of public schools in the U.S. report an increase in students seeking mental health services. According to a survey released Tuesday by the National Center for Education Statistics, however, data shows about half of the schools surveyed report that they were able to provide these needed supports. Got some repeats here. Okay, uh, Bleeping Computer reported that WhatsApp scam enables hijackers to hijack account accounts. A flaw in the WhatsApp's call forwarding feature can be exploited by malicious actors to take full control of victims' accounts and gain access to their personal messages and contact lists. CloudSec SEK Founder and CEO Raul Sassi reports, WhatsApp users can avoid being targeted by enabling a two-factor authentication. ASCD Smart Brief for K-12 leadership reports um, a story from K-12 Dive says district reset centers from alternatives to suspension. Reset, reset centers at about 60 middle and high schools in the Dallas Independent School District allow students a chance to de-escalate and talk with trained staff and students about behavior, says Superintendent Michael Hinojose. Hino I probably butchered that. I apologize. The district, which has eliminated most suspensions, wanted to reinvent its dis disciplinary approach. So it is also so it also added stronger behavioral supports, professional development for classroom management, and better data collection to ensure equity, fairness, and individualized approaches. And Time reported that imposter syndrome can be a useful tool, CEO says. Ancestry.com CEO Deborah Liu says she has learned to turn imposter syndrome into a tool, using it as a reminder that leaders should acknowledge they're not always the smartest people in the room and we always need help. Quote, people fail when they pretend they know everything, Liu says. That's a good point. What do you think of that? The next story I have for you is from Oakland side, California, and from it was covered from the Oakland side. It says high school intern service classroom aides. A California high school has looked toward high schoolers enrolled in an education focused 
Career Pathway program as classroom aides in a nearby elementary school. The students who are part of the internship program being piloted work with students, assist teachers, and may take the lead on a lesson. This uh, next story was from the VT Digger in Vermont. Vermont, to, Vermont is to alter how special education funds are distributed. Measures designed to simplify the funding process are resulting in special education funding shortfalls in Vermont, leaving some districts to make hard decision, decisions about how to bridge the gaps. In response to reports of overspending in special education programs, state lawmakers shifted to a, cons a census block grant funding model, but some school leaders say the model is unfair. We're going to take a quick commercial ba break and uh, we're going to be right back. Right now, right now, you might be struggling might be through your classes class. or even failing them. You might be worried that you may not finish high school. There might have even been a thought that you may not be smart enough. Well, the New Heights Educational Group begs to differ. We not only think you are smart enough, but with our help, you will complete your high school diploma. The New Heights Educational Group strives to improve your academic success through its tutoring services. To learn more, please visit newheightseducation.org and contact us. New Heights Educational Group educational resources to help reach your goals. Welcome back to Education in the News with the New Heights Show on Education. I'm your host, Pamela Clark. And the next news story I have from you is from the Heckinger Report. It's a study that uh, it's titled, Teachers Define Gifted Differently. Teachers' individual judgment calls may result in different students being identified as gifted. According to a study by Karen Rambo Hernandez, an associate professor of education at Texas A&M University, findings showed that despite receiving the same training, teachers were inclined to make gifted determinations differently, with almost no overlap. The Washington Post reported that a youth organization launches the AAPI History Lessons. AAPI Youth Rising, an organization founded last year by middle school students in California, has developed a program that offers free lessons on Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander history, which launched as part of the Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month. The organization is hopeful that more schools will offer some lessons, such lessons. I shared that with you the other day as well. I just had it um, differently worded. And the 74 reported that a school leader touts fun foundational skills approach. More students in a school district in Tennessee are learning to read since the district adopted a foundational skills program, writes Jonathan Criswell, director of schools in the Milan Special School District. In this commentary, Criswell shares teachers' observations that the approach also is helping students learn to read faster. Also from the 74, a Baltimore teacher keeps students together learning. Okay, I've shared the story before. It's the one uh, with the Kyer butt, so I just shared that a little bit ago. We're going to switch. A lot of repeats. The 74 reported that Gates program aims to set students up for future success. The Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation has launched the Accelerate Ed Seamless Pathways to Degrees and Careers program to help K-12 students gain real-world experience and break into their chosen careers faster, writes Gates Foundation exec Sarah Allen. In this piece, Allen discusses the program and why it's important for students to have a clear path forward after K-12 learning. 
Now, I will say that Gates was uh, partially behind the Common Core, and we know what a failure that was. And I don't trust anything he says about education whatsoever. So, um, yeah, anyways, enough said on that. Um, Ohio Ed Updates. This is from the Akron Beacon, Beacon Journal, and it says, End of Pandemic Era Free Lunch Program, How Summit County School Districts Are Affected. More than 22 million children receive free or low-cost lunch each day or each school day from the National School Lunch Program during the 2020 school year. In April 2021, the U.S. Department of Education was approved to continue for the free breakfast and free lunch to all students. The pandemic-era seamless summer option program ends in, on June 30th. That won't change the mill program at Akron Public School where free lunches were available to all students year-round prior to the pandemic and will continue to be offered. Other districts, however, will have to adjust because of the extended federal program's upcoming end date and cutoff for additional funding. So I know we've covered that and covered that in different ways, but yeah. All right, uh, Dayton NBC2 reports that Dayton Public School is holding a hiring event for teachers. The Dayton Public School District is holding a teacher hiring event in preparation for the 2022-2023 school year. Teachers are needed across all grade levels and subject areas. However, the district is especially in need of bilingual teachers. The teacher hiring event is Wednesday, June the 1st, which has already passed. The, the event runs from 9 to 11 a.m. Okay, well, I guess that's not important. It was at the DPS community room in Dayton on Ludlow Street. But I would not necessarily think all of these positions are filled. I would still contact someone um, and see what open positions there are because there's really a great shortage. Youngstown NBC 21 shared that Quick Med Urgent Care receives grant from Department of Health Education to Expand. Quick Med Urgent Care, known as QMUC, has been selected as the only for-profit organization to receive a grant from the Ohio Department of Health, ODH, and Ohio Department of Education, ODE, to increase the number of school-based health centers, SBHC, and qualifying schools. The mission of the grant is to treat the whole child so they can remain in school healthy and ready to learn. QMUC is partnering with Salem City School District along with Liberty Local School District to position medical clinics on their campuses to meet the non-academic needs to support the whole child. The $1.8 million awarded to QMUC, Salem City, and Liberty Local Schools will extend to 2024. Uh, the Toledo Blade reported that graduation day arrives for hundreds of Toledo students. In moments, the soon-to-be 181 graduates would be would be met with air horns, shouts, and cheers from onlookers for Bowser High School's graduation ceremony. But for a few brief moments, Miss Ottman took advantage of the brief pauses in the procession to take everything in before the ceremony. And Bowser wasn't the only Toledo Public School graduation Tuesday. School High School, or Scott High School, excuse me, was graduating 109 in the afternoon. As Start High School was celebrating 241 graduates at an evening ceremony. Galleon Enquirer reports that a community foundation, foundation awards over $184,000 in scholarships. The Community Foundation from Crawford County recently awarded over $184,000 in scholarships to both graduating seniors and current college students. As President Lisa Workman replied, quote, due to high dropout rate of college students and the high cost of post-secondary education, we have come to see value in giving an increasing number of scholarships to current college students. 
graduating seniors also already have so many more scholarship opportunities than they will than they will later in their college career. This year, the amount awarded to college students will be $89,000 of the total we've awarded so far, or more than 48% of our scholarships going to current college students. <clears throat> Cleveland 106.5 FM reported that the Browns give back homestead Falls City Schools Celebrating the team's commitment to education and youth and high school football, the Cleveland Browns hosted a special field groundbreaking ceremony at Olmsted Falls City Schools Vitamix Field at Charles Harding Memorial Stadium. It marks the 13th high-quality synthetic turf field to be installed in Ohio by the Browns, courtesy of Haslam and Johnson Families and Browns Give Back since its field initiative launched six years ago in May of 2016. The Homestead Falls City School surface is also facilitated through a grant provided in partnership with the Browns NFL Foundation. The local initiative support corporation LISC through the NFL Foundation Grassroots Program. Okay, we're getting close to uh, running out of time. I'll share a few more stories. <clears throat> this is from Philanthropy News Digest. And um, this one kind of looks familiar. But it says uh, KAJ Labs announced lithocurrency. And U.S. dollar grants were made to the NAACP and the National Homelessness Law Center. You can look up this story on philanthropynewsdigest.org and type in KAJ Labs. Uh, it's not a really long uh, thing. It's, let me see. Okay, it says that they pledged to contribute $50 million in over 10 years to nonprofit organizations that support racial and social justice. Awarded the litho currency in U.S. dollars, grants were made to the NAACP and National Homelessness Law Center on the second anniversary of the murder of George Floyd. I end quote, I think blockchain specifically true DeFi, the sense of decentralized finance applications will play a big role in removing bias in several of our daily human interactions, says KAJ founder Joel Kasser. By building decentralized, trustless services and products, we truly believe we can take bias out of lending, leasing, short-term credit, fundraising, investment, and many more business sectors that impact our daily lives. Bear with me for a moment. Okay, the next story I have for you is from Middleweb on Smart Brief. And this was covered by Manistee News Advocate in Michigan. Tree planting is part of a sustainable forestry lesson. Middle Michigan middle school students planted more than 250 sapling trees in a clear-cut area of their school forest as part of a lesson in conservation and sustainable forestry. Students will return to the forest to observe their saplings growth over the next several years, says Superintendent Gina Hagen. And the Daily Camera in Boulder, California reported that Colorado Districts offers online reading interventions. A pilot program of reading interventions for third to fifth graders is being rolled out in Colorado District found success with online school approaches employed since earlier in the pandemic. Eight schools have signed up to participate, with students identified to the program being those less likely to receive supports because they are on the cusp, that's in quotes, of reading proficiency. And Medical Dialogues, 
uh, reported that limiting screen time use improves kids' physical activity. Research published by JAMA, J-A-M-A, Pediatrics, involving 181 children and 164 adults from 89 families found that a recreational screen media reduction intervention resulted in an increase in children's engagement in physical activity. Quote, we found that children in the screen reduction intervention group have had an average of 45 minutes more daily physical activity compared to children in the control group, says researcher Jasper Peterson. And the Journal News in Hamilton, Ohio reports that sixth graders sew toys based on pre-K class drawings. Sixth graders in Mountain Ridge Middle School's Family and Consumer Science class surprise pre-K students at a nearby school with stuffed toys based on the younger students drawing inspired by the book and quotes I need my monster teacher Elizabeth Vano or, or Vano, Vanu maybe um, said who got the project idea from Facebook says students crafted the toys with extra care knowing that their young recipients would love and play with them And News 13 in Orlando, Florida reported that lawmakers approved training mandate for Florida school staff. A bipartisan bill approved by Florida lawmakers would mandate that 80% of school staff members um, have youth mental health awareness training. The measure also requires the State Department, uh, the State Department of Education to report on school safety annually and for law enforcement officers to undergo assail assailant emergency drills. Well, I think that concludes today. I, I appreciate you spending this time with me and listening to my show. Remember, my show is on every Wednesday and airs at 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. You can also join Barbara Bullen on Sundays, where her show airs by 6 p.m., and she covers civil rights, the history of it, and she does such a wonderful job. I hope you've checked out her show if you haven't. We have a lot of wonderful shows here at the New Heights Show on Education, covering such a wide variety of topics. So check out our our show page at radio.newheightseducation.org. Until next time.